the FCM report, Dr. Warden? We will add the FCM report under um, after the CAO's report. Are you okay with that? Yes. Everybody in favor? Any other additions or deletions to the... We have a motion to accept the, uh, to approve the agenda as circulated with the notice of change. Move. Moved by Councillor McLeod, seconded by Deputy Warden Daphne, all in favor? Aye. Contrary minded, motion's carried. We also want to acknowledge that this meeting is being held in Unimagi, one of seven traditional districts of the Mi'kma'ki and the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. So with that, uh, our first item up to on the agenda tonight, or this afternoon, pardon me, is that uh, Dan Coffin is going to introduce her new uh, tourism and recreation team. So <clears throat> I'll turn it over to Dan and welcome our new staff. Thank you very much, Warden and Council, for, for seeing us this afternoon. Um, as you know, for the last three years, uh, tourism and recreation departments have been working somewhat separately on, on uh, very similar projects. So when it comes to trails and placemaking and community development, there was a, an awful lot of overlap, uh, a lot of shared work and, and a lot of good cooperative work that, that took place between Lydia Kerr and I. Um, we did, uh, there was a decision made with administration to move forward with merging the departments and bringing us back under one fold. Uh, and with that, we've actually bulked up the department a little bit, as you know, uh, with two new employees and we're here to introduce them today. So um, I will say the tourism coordinator role is gonna be very much focused on working on the trails, uh, administrative work, working on the tourism strategy, working on a lot of the placemaking um, administrative side of things with uh, applications and funding programs and whatnot and tracking that stuff as well as working with engaging uh, tourism operators and community members at, as a whole. And in the recreation coordinator and physical activity coordinator role, it's very much going to be focused on getting back to some community programming, learning what the needs of the communities are, as we've learned from some of the placemaking initiatives we've done already, and trying to feed those needs through uh, facilitating and supporting programs within those communities to help help increase the physical activity and overall health of our society and residents. So um, without further uh, ado, I guess I will, I'll share that our next steps for it as a team is the three of us will be hitting the road over a series of a couple of days to visit all counties and all districts or within the county, I should say. Um, and then we will be doing a, a trip where they'll be coming out on their own and scheduling appointments with each of you as counselors to, to learn a little bit more about your district, spend a couple of hours getting to know some of the community members that, that you guys have regular contact with and work with on a regular basis as well. So, so I'll, uh, I'll start off by introducing, uh, letting them introduce themselves, but here's Colleen, our Tourism and Community Development Coordinator. Uh, good afternoon, counselors. My name is Colleen Whelan smith and I'm happy to be here working as the Community Tourism and Community Development Coordinator. Um, I've worked in tourism related industries in the past, but this is my first experience working promoting tourism directly. Um, it's also my first experience working for a government organization. So um, I'll give you a short history of my, my life experience. Um, worked at Governor's Pub and Eatery uh, for 14 years in multiple areas of the food and beverage industry. Uh, in 2014, in 2004 rather, I began working at Member Two Trade and Convention Center, um, and moved into event sales and management in 2005. We executed events of all types, from weddings to multi-day conferences to gala fundraisers. Uh, in early 2012, um, I took a position of, of sales manager at Cambridge Suites in Sydney, and I left that position in August of that year after my daughter was killed in a car accident. Uh, I decided to return to school in 2013 and completed a business administration diploma from NSCC uh, in 2016 and a Bachelor of Arts Community Studies from CBU in 2017. Uh, throughout 2018, 19, 20, I worked in food and beverage, uh, Portside Beer Garden, uh, Boardwalk Tap Room and Eatery, and Daniel's Ale House. And uh, then I left the food and beverage industry after COVID hit. Um, and I started working for Escazoni Cold Logistics, uh, Live Store Sydney as a bookkeeper and logistics coordinator. And I just left that position to, to join this team. Um, so I'm very grateful to be here. I'm looking forward to the opportunities. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for back. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, Councillor, Councillors. Um, I'd like to say uh, it's a pleasure to be aboard. 
pleasure to be here. My name is Christopher Whitford, or you can go by Chris. I am the new Recreation and Physical Activity Coordinator here for the county. And um, as far as my background, uh, where I've been at, I'll just give a very brief overview, but feel free to ask further questions or come and see me in my office. Uh, basically, I have a Bachelor of Kinesiology and a Diploma in Police Foundations. Uh, in the sport and recreation side of things, I've been lucky enough to have worked and coached in different places around the world. I've lived in five different provinces, four different countries, all being involved in the sport and recreation side of things as far as physical uh, recreation coordinator, um, camp directors, recreation directors. I ran my own hockey school at one time, as well as I had the luxury of coaching at the British Nationals and the USA Junior Olympics. So I have a very extensive background in programming, uh, as well as working with facilities, uh, basically anything from A to Z that has to do with recreation, I've probably involved some way or another or running it. So I'm looking forward to bringing all my expertise I've learned um, over my years of service in the sport and recreation world to bring it to the county. But more importantly, uh, I'm super excited to learn from the county itself, right? Uh, so from the members of the county, what are they looking for? What is it that they need? Uh, what will make their lives more active, more physically, mentally, and emotionally? And that's what I'm excited most to do. So we'll start with the deputy ward. Good afternoon, nice to meet you and great introductions. My name is uh, Norman McDonald. I'm District 8 Councillor, which starts at uh, the bottom of Effie's Brook, which is on this side of Neal's Harbor, all the way encompasses up to Capstick, uh, Cape North, Dingwall area, Bay St. Lawrence, and just on this side of Meat Cove. Welcome aboard, uh, Colleen and Chris. Uh, my name is Perla McLeod. I'm District 2 Councillor. Uh, so it will be Big Bedeck, Middle River, Bedeck Inlet, and Nyanza. Um, I'm happy to meet you and uh, looking forward to work together. Hi, welcome to both of you. I'm Barbara Longva, and I'm District 4, which goes from the Bell Museum. Uh, down Bay Road to Seal Island Bridge with uh, New Hamilton, New Harris, and all the way to Smoky Mountain, North Shore, English Town. And uh, I'm looking forward to working with you both. I'm Jackie Organ. I'm the council for Dis District 7 from the two churches in, in North Inganish, around Niels Harbor, Smelt Brook, uh, to Effie's Brook and look forward to get, picking your brains. Thanks, welcome aboard. Uh, good afternoon, <clears throat> excuse me. My name is Fraser Patterson. I'm the uh, counselor for District 5, which I just found out that Colleen is one of my uh, constituents. Um, and Chris, we will talk about Chris's hockey team selection, but we'll leave that at that. Anyway, welcome. Uh, for Bruce and I, I think it's very refreshing younger people uh, not that we're getting old. No, of but. course not. <laughs> Actually, Councillor McDonald just come over to me and you'll notice the shirts they have on and the shirt I have on. He has dated this one as being one of the older <laughs> shirts he called it. So anyway, looking forward to working with both of you. And uh, it, it, I guess it's, it's exciting times for uh, Victoria County. Uh, we just had a transit meeting, which was you know, beyond my expectations, as I said there. Uh, tourism is our biggest, if not our second biggest industry or somewhere with fishery, they're together, I'm sure. And then the whole notion of physical activity, especially for seniors, is, is uh, prominent in our, in our communities. So again, there's, there's lots of work to be done and I'm sure you folks are up to it. Thank you, and I should have mentioned earlier, Councillor Paul McDeal is in another commitment representing the municipality and one of our neighboring communities at uh, two o'clock this afternoon. That's why he's not here. If he should come back, 
Uh, before you leave, I'll make sure that uh, he gets a chance to introduce himself. And finally, I'm Bruce Morrison. I, I'm the counselor for uh, District 3, which is Bedeck, and also the warden of Victoria County. And uh, we do look forward to working with you. And uh, certainly, you represent a commitment we're making in recreation and tourism in Victoria County. So um, it's... Uh, it's an investment in the right direction for us, and uh, we look forward to, to working with you. And uh, I'd like to thank Dan and Leanne and Alex as well for uh, giving us uh, recommendations to help improve um, both our programs and the services we provide in both those. So um, anybody have any questions or comments they would like to ask these three folks before we... Be good, Dan, is there anything you wish to add prior to? That's great. Thank We're you very good. much. I appreciate your time. Very good. We appreciate well, we that. We'll see you all in, in the district. And I would, would encourage you, and I know Dan will do this anyway, that particularly if you're new or relatively new, it's a big county. Make sure the counselors are your best resource in each of those districts. They know the people, they know the road, they know the programs. So I would encourage you to contact them at any time. And um, if you need any direction, no matter how small they ask or how large they ask, that's where it's always a good place to start. So, and I know that they'll be more than willing to offer their assistance and advice and direction to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So come forward uh, Mr. Donovan, please. So while Lyle gets settled, those of us who are very familiar with Lyle and we're very appreciative of the time and efforts that he spent, particularly the last two weeks, we always very value your commitment to the municipality, Lyle, and particularly in the last two weeks where we had to deal with Fiona. And uh, we just want to recognize you for the uh, great job that you did the last couple of weeks. And uh, we ask that you come to council this evening or this afternoon. I'm sorry, I'm not used to daylight hours yet, but. Uh, we uh, have asked Lyle to perhaps do a, give us a short synopsis of how things were short. I emphasize that, Lyle, thank you. Um, so we asked Lyle to provide a, a short synopsis of uh, what he had to face and uh, his uh, dealings over the last two weeks. So. First of all, I have to apologize. Uh, my own phone had a piece of Oh, not a problem given the circumstances. Do you want me to sit to talk to this? Yes. yes, please. Yeah. That's hard for me. Okay. So you'll take us through your presentation and we'll open it up for questions and comments if that works for you, sir. All right. So, how would you like to do it? There's slides in here I'd like to talk about during the slides and questions for slides. Or you can write the questions down as we go. Um, we will, if the slides are, are district specific, maybe we can stop and just do any questions or comments. Yeah, we can do that. And uh, allocated about 30 minutes for you. So as long as we're cognizant of the time. I'm so We knew your 10 would be 30. That's why we. <laughs> So I'll leave it up to you if there are questions. I would just ask that uh, um, you direct the questions so that we keep it in order uh, either through the chair and that way we don't uh, overwhelm Lyle with a lot of questions at the same time. Just put your hand up and... So we got our first official report from the Council of Council Meeting on Tuesday, March 26th. They could probably heard me all through Bedeck anyway. So, but anyway, um, everybody, people knew about it before ahead of time. However, uh, we've got our first notification from EMO Nova Scotia and Environment Canada on September 20th. Uh, 
At this point, it was told to us that it'd be a potential of being as strong or stronger than Hurricane Dorian and stuff. So we were really keeping an eye on it. So this is what, this was our first update. As you can see, uh, the confidence level at this point was low because they couldn't make they can't make actual predictions. I see all kinds of online weather updates and stuff, and, and they're saying this is what it's going to be. Until it's 24 hours out, we're still unsure uh, of what's going to happen. And even at that point, we're still unsure. So the track had it coming up, uh, the eye had it coming up just east of uh, us here in Victoria County. Um, obviously, you can see that that, has cha that that changed. It actually come up west of us. Um, so not a huge deal. Uh, after the notification of the storm, it was usually the next day before we have our, have our teleconference. That's typically the way it goes. They'll send us out our first update, then we'll have a teleconference the next day. They sent us out this email update that I, forward, I forwarded to all of you. And all of a sudden I get this other email. We're gonna have a teleconference today about this, which really raised a flag, okay? So we continued to watch it closely, put notifications out to you guys. You guys all got it as municipal staff. Uh, I put it out on my EMO Facebook page, uh, and the public was asking a lot of questions. So on September 21st, prior to the storm, a question was asked by one of, one of the councillors uh, if we were announcing where the storm shelters are, warning people to clean up their yards and get candles ready, etc. This came through Leanne. It came from one of the councillors through Leanne. Uh, and when I responded, I thought it was three very good questions that were in that email. So I... I clicked all of you as well, because it was good information uh, that, that was asked. So, and that was the email response. I don't think you need me to read that response out, uh, but the three questions were about comfort centers, uh, uh, candles, and uh, uh, where, the comfort, where the comfort centers are and where, when they were open. Anyway, we had, done, we had done all the checks. I had sent out the emails to all the um, and done checks to all the places that we use for comfort centers and stuff. So they were prepared and ready. The problem with notifying people ahead of time that a storm, that this place is a comfort center and that place is a comfort center, everybody probably knows over the years anyway, being connected to their communities where the comfort centers are. However, when we put notifications out, we've learned in the past, when we put notifications out to say that uh, the comfort center in Iona uh, is at the community hall and stuff. People will go out in the height of the storm to see if the comfort center is open. And that is not what we want. We ask people to be prepared for 72 hours for that very reason, because it's not safe to go out. So that was one answer that I put out. The other one is was about candles. We recommend for people to put, instead of using uh, flame anymore, we use battery powered candles. Um, and stuff. So in the recommendation of the, the notification of comfort centers, as soon as we were requested for comfort centers, we didn't wait 72 hours. We, we opened them earlier than the 72 hours. Uh, as prepared as people think they are, they're not ready. And a lot of times it's upset this day and age, and it's not the comfort that they need, they need something to charge their electronic device, their cell phone, their tablet, their, their laptop or whatever and stuff. And that's reality. That's, that's this day and, day and age we live in. So we did send a notification uh, a request to all Victoria County Comfort Centers with uh, backup power to check and run their generators to make sure they were in operation and functioning. One was discovered not to be working but uh, they called a mechanic to get it serviced right away. And he pushed people aside to make sure the comfort center was in operation. Uh, it was at the North Shore District Fire Hall. Um, that, that generator is on its last legs. He got it working for this storm. He said, but it's not gonna last. So they had it for that function, that storm. Um, we had another EMO update. Uh, the 21st and then on the 22nd, the teleconference on the 22nd, the EMO office in Halifax seemed to be very worked up about this storm. Um, 
they were picturing, and, and rightfully so, in defense of Halifax. Halifax was nervous about it because when Hurricane Juan hit there in 2003, um, it was quite substantial. A lot of infrastructure damage in Hurricane Juan, and uh, they even had two deaths related to Hurricane Juan. So they were really keeping a close eye on this one. Um, at that point, we were pretty sure that it was going to hit Cape Button Island, but as you'll see later in, in the slides, it was quite massive. It was when the eye was passing, the center of the storm was 600 kilometers across. It was huge. So in this slide here, you can see uh, to the one, I don't know if you can see my, yeah, you can't see my, my laser pointer on this, but to the picture on the, left, the far left-hand side, uh, where the confidence level has a risk assessment. We've been watching storms for years, and uh, you see in the red, I'll just point out to you guys here, you see in the red here, around Cape Breton Island, uh, the North Shore, Amherst area, that's storm surge. I've been doing EMO for 15 years, and that's the first EMO update that I see with storm surge on the east side of Cape Breton Island, all the way around from the North Shore, all the way up past Cape Breton and into the mainland Nova Scotia. That's what really worried us. That was that storm surge. And as most of you can see, that was the biggest damage that we got was storm surge. Wind knocks down trees, uh, people's homes are affected. Uh, some trees block their driveways, power. Uh, there has been damage to a few homes that we know we are aware of and stuff, but it's the storm surge that really causes significant damage. So as you can see in the track, it was moving a little more east on the bottom picture there. And on this is from uh, the bottom picture is from the National Hurricane Center out of Florida. And the one on the right is out of the Hurricane Center in Halifax. Uh, so that's where that came come from. So as you can see, they're still talking um, here just, uh, just east of Cape Breton as it's coming up. You're still talking 195 kilometer per hour winds and stuff. This was still a category four, 200 kilometers off Nova Scotia. We've never seen that before. So that was a worry. So during the preparation of the storm, lo and behold, this is, this is, this is where the comedy part comes in. Um, go figure, Friday night, I pull up to the gas station and the starter went in the EMO truck. So lo and behold, so be it. I said, well, we pushed it out of the way. I went home and got my own Volkswagen to on and I picked up a spike in my own tire in my Volkswagen table on. I said, Frig this, I'm going to go home. And I went home. <laughs> so there's, there's the spike there, still sticking out of the tire, still on my front, front doorstep. So I went home. <laughs> so home. Anyway, the storm hit through the night on Friday into Saturday. Uh, I started getting reports of power outages, damage, trees down early in the morning hours. I believe, Fraser, you were the first one to email me at 1 2. When, when, yeah, something like that, that Fraser had lost his power. Uh, so that was the first email I believe I received. And then, and then it started coming out. The other counselors were responding. We lost it at 110. We lost it at, we lost it around one o'clock in the morning, between one and two o'clock in the morning. So, and that was basically the majority of Cape Breton Island. Um, now I was talking with you, Mr. Warden, shortly thereafter. And there was places, am I correct in saying there was places that didn't lose power at all? or for very short periods of time in the area? Did it lose until the next day? Did it lose until the next day? Yeah. Yeah. So that morning, Saturday morning, it was 7.24. The peak of the storm wasn't supposed to be from between eight and 10 o'clock in the morning. We received a call from Warden Morrison at 7.24 a.m. and we had a brief discussion about taking out a state of local emergency. Uh, for safety reasons, try to make people stay home and off the roads, as we were still not in the peak of the storm. It was agreed upon and was set in motion. The paperwork was filed, and the province and the minister approved the uh, state of local emergency. Lord Morrison spoke to the CAO, and we all agreed. Now, 
as you are all probably aware uh, through any training that you've done, whether it was the old basic emergency management course that you've done years ago, because some of you have been here for a while. <laughs> some of you have done recent ICS training and stuff. But as it is, when we take out a state of local emergency, it's typically done with the warden and the majority of council has to approve it. However, in certain circumstances, the warden himself may approve it. Now, we were time dependent with the peak of the storm. This was at 724 and we were time dependent by we put the approval in and we got it back to want to get it out before the peak was hitting us at nine o'clock. So Warden Morrison approved it and the minister, uh, the provincial minister approved it as well. Uh, we went up to, pardon me? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, yeah. Yeah. So, so we we all agreed. We were at the point uh, just at the same time. Uh, Cape Breton Regional Municipality was taken out of state state of local emergency. And they're actually still in a state of local emergency. As a municipality, we get to have it for seven days and we can renew it every seven days thereafter. Now, they take, they've taken it out for a different reason. There's multiple reasons why you can take out a state of local emergency. Uh, ours was for safety reasons, to make sure the roads were safe, people traveling. There was a lot of washouts, banks. We didn't want people going over into ditches and getting hurt vehicles. Um, tried to make people stay home. One of our complications with taking out a state of local emergency is the enforcement of it. It's one thing to say that we're taking out a state of local emergency, and typically we're supposed to have it enforced by law enforcement. Now, Cape Breton Regional, not a problem. They have hundreds of police officers. We usually have two RCMP officers on duty. Well, one in English and maybe one or two on duty in Bedeck. So for them to get out and enforce it, it's, it's a tough deal. The best we can do is, is post notifications, take it over our voting system, and let people know that it's not safe to be out. Then we've notified people to say, there's a state of local emergency. If you go out, you're at your own risk. Because if we didn't take it out and something happened, what would have happened? They would have come back to us as a municipality and they would have said, why didn't, you, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you make everybody stay home and stuff? So it was, it was for multiple reasons, but the big reason was safety. 24 hours after, we terminated our state of local emergency. Uh, and we did that because uh, Public Works, Nova Scotia Public Works, uh, formerly, you probably know, Department of Transportation, uh, Transportation Infrastructure Removal, they're now called Nova Scotia Public Works. Well, they were able to get out and pile on and, and put up barricades for roads that weren't passable and stuff. So that safety issue wasn't there, it wasn't necessary anymore. So the state of local emergency uh, was the first voyage alert notification we took out as a result of Hurricane Fiona. Uh, it didn't happen until that day and stuff. Uh, that was the first time we took it out. Um, Parks Canada decided on Saturday morning to close the Cabot Trail between Inganish and Neils Harbor uh, for safety reasons. Uh, we, have, we, we were all under the impression and Warden Morrison, uh, both Warren Morrison and the CAO both contacted me about the possibility of Black Brook, Still Brook washing out again as, as happened a few months ago and stuff. And we were all under the anticipation that that was gonna wash out again. It didn't. That actually was the best part of the road. It, it maintained itself. But what was happening during the height of the storm, one of the foremen from the contract company was working at Stillbrook, um, was traveling between Inganish and Neils Harbor to check the site. And a large, and when I say large rock, uh, he estimated about the size of a laptop around, and it was big around, uh, come up out of the ocean and struck his truck. And that was a significant rock. And I've seen some pretty large rocks moved bigger than that as well. But that came up a lot. That was close to Lake East Head, Little Smoky, if you're familiar with the area. So that was, that was quite substantial. Uh, so they closed that road for safety reasons and 
justified as we didn't want anybody getting hurt. So I'm just gonna zip through some of the pictures that you can see. Um, these, ones, these ones are in Neal's Harbor, the, the top left, uh, just down where the old pharmacy used to be close to the garage. Uh, that's the road down from the lighthouse. I had to do a wellness check on somebody up there uh, at 8.30, 9 o'clock that morning. I could barely, I was nervous walking down there. Um, they thought the lady had, they couldn't get a hold of her anyway. They thought she was, anyway, I won't get into that, but anyway, she was okay. She was just in rough shape. Uh, you can see where all the damage was done. Uh, former counselor, that's large tree up against former counselor David Donovan's house there. Uh, that's some of the damage that was done in the New Haven area. Uh, it was uh, Jack Counselor Organ's area again, and stuff, and she got to see it. Uh, Councillor Daphne was down, Councillor McDonald was around, uh, Warden Morrison was around as well as, uh, to see the damage. I believe our COO and Kelly Brett passed over the area when it was closed, <laughs> but they drove over. But anyway, they were in the area, so there was significant damage. Um, you can see other damage around. Uh, one house was totally de demolished, and this was a majority of in New Haven. Now, this picture, you, you can see in, in the sixth picture in the bottom there, the second picture over on the bottom side and the left-hand side, that's, that's one of the heads for our water system in Neal's Harbor. That was exposed over two feet out of the ground. Uh, the picture in the far left there, that's the roadway under that or what used to be there. The roadway was gone, totally gone and stuff. Um, now this bottom right-hand side here, this bottom right-hand picture, that's where the bridge used to be in on Fairview Road going down. There's four residence homes down in that area and there was two occupied. We were very close to losing a life that night, that morning and stuff. We had one of our residents that went down to check his basement and just as he was down there, uh, a wave, and he was 150 feet back from the ocean. That's how far back his house was, and 50 feet off normal, where the water level normally is. And he never thought he'd ever get touched by a wave, let alone damage. Anyway, the wave busted through his house, and he was submerged in three feet, four feet of water. It was up to his chest, and he almost drowned. And as the water was going back out through his basement door, uh, it was pulling him out through the door. And he grabbed a hold of the wall as he was going by. And just lucky he was able to grab a hold of something because I don't know if we would have ever found him and stuff. So he was a very lucky man, uh, to say the least. Anyway, this was the picture there. There's all kinds of more pictures there. Uh, this home had significant damage. Some of it was the home, in the, this is the same, same house. Uh, the wave action, you can see it's right up over the peak of this house. It's right close to the co-op in Neal's Harbor. That's one of those uh, thousand pound propane tanks that the water tossed around like it was a baseball, uh, moved it around. Significant damage in this home. Uh, don't know how salvageable the home is. Uh, Jackie, you might have more information on that uh, than I do. The homeowner's coming down, coming up from the States this week, and he's going to assess it, but uh, I've seen the pictures that can. It, it's not hopeful. It's it, down, the downstairs. Is, yeah, uh, it's not hopeful. Uh, so this, some of, some of the trees down, this was the lady, uh, Dora Rogers, who lost her home in New Haven, um, her home and her property and stuff. Uh, some damage along the highway, Neal's Harbor. Uh, the fish plant, to, to look inside that building there, we weren't allowed in. It was just obliterated, just the damage that was caused inside that fish plant. And at first glance, they were estimating $2 million uh, in damage. And I don't know if that number is accurate or not. That was told, what was told to me by the manager, but significant damage there. Uh, the one on the left-hand side is, is the fish plant. Uh, that's the bridge from Fairview Road that you see up on the wharf over there. So. Uh, it was still in Neal's Harbor. It was still in New Haven, but just not where it was supposed to be. Um, this, this vessel here, 
was, you've seen a few pictures back, was up in the gentleman's yard. It actually was is up in the brook. Uh, that went in and out of the harbor, apparently three or four times, they have it on video, and set down on his Harley Davidson right here. You see the Harley Davidson under the boat. So, lost that. Road construction began, cleanup began right away to, to break a path in this roadway. The storm hit Saturday, Sunday morning. Uh, I probably could have drove if I would have had the, the truck. By noontime, I probably could have drove uh, or my EMO truck down the road through New Haven. It was shocking with how fast it went. Um, but the equipment worked and uh, we got the uh, vehicle and the boat hauled out of there. Uh, the boat, the, that vessel there sustained very little damage. Um, as soon as we realized that there were four homes cut off in Fairview Road uh, with no access, we requested one of the walking bridges that had been built back in November for the rainstorm. Uh, that was, we had two of them built, one for the Oregon Road uh, and one at Talbot Vale. And one of them were donated uh, to another organization. The other one was still available and was still on site at the Oregon Road. So at, they opened that around seven o'clock that evening and I got home around nine o'clock and went down and snapped that picture of the walking bridge, walked it. I didn't follow the book, so it was good. So now at least we have footpath into them, which was fantastic because it took, it took a week to get that walking bridge basically built in to Tarbot Vale. So it was nice to have that access to get that in, in place. Now, that's not gonna be permanent. That question was asked, will that be a permanent fixture there and they've never replaced that bridge? No, they are gonna replace that bridge. It's gonna be covered under disaster uh, financial assistance uh, that will be taken care of. But anyway, that was put in place on the evening of the 27th. So uh, this was some of the damage on Beach Crossing Road. Um, this was uh, a home in Inganish Ferry, Inganish Harbor. A uh, tree had fell across a roof. Um, I had to reach out to the Insurance Bureau of Canada. The insurance company was giving her a little bit of runaround and said, well, we, we're going to concentrate our efforts in industrial Cape Breton. And too bad, so sad. So anyway, quick call to the Provincial Coordination Center and spoke to the liaison that we had in the Provincial Coordination Center from the Insurance Bureau of Canada. And that afternoon she had calls and made and, and had somebody looking after it. So actually it was the next day. Um, that's the Glengoran uh, Beach Resort in Ganesh. Uh, they had some sig significant damage. Uh, the Point Cottages in Ganesh also had some damage. Uh, the Bedeck waterfront and even, and not just the waterfront, but all along Shore Road. Uh, had significant damage that I see there's a lot of good repair work happened there and stuff. So that was it there. So like I said, we decided to terminate the, the state and local's emergency 24 hours after it was initiated. The ocean had calmed and Nova Scotia Public Works had made the roadway safe and secure uh, to make sure it was safe for passing motorists. Um, I put this up here just to bring it your, to your attention. This is in Lunenburg Harbor. Now, this has nothing to do with Victoria County, but this is Lunenburg Harbor at eight o'clock on Saturday morning during the height of the storm. That is high tide. They had a scare that this was actually a working tsunami. You see how all the water was drawn out, and that's a typical sign of a tsunami. But what had happened, the storm drew all the water out and pushed it east. So we were lucky enough to get Lunenburg's ocean. But that's, that's what happened. So these things, these phenomena do happen when storms happen. Not necessarily, is it a tsunami or could it be a tsunami? But I thought it was significant to put it into pictures here. Uh, the EMO coordinator from Lunenburg sent me these. And be aware that if this ever happens in this area, doesn't necessarily mean that it is a tsunami, but it doesn't mean that it's not a tsunami either. Okay, that's why these things need to be reported ASAP so we can get a meteorologist on the phone. And that's exactly what they did. They got our EMO meteorologist, his name is Bob Robichaud on the phone to ask them, is this what's happening? Do we have to put out an evacuation order for the town of Lunenburg? 
and stuff. But as it turned out, the water level come back by high tide, it was back to normal. Okay, so I thought that was important to show you if you ever see that in Victoria County, because Victoria County is all along the water. So it could be pulled out of here and put somewhere else. But it's not saying that it's not a tsunami. On the morning of September 25th, basically 24 hours after the Iowa storm had passed, we decided to open the comfort centers. We opened seven comfort centers, okay? Cape North, Neal's Harbor, New Haven, Inganish, North Shore, Ross Ferry, Big Bidore, and Middle River. Now, Neal's Harbor, New Haven, they did have some problems with their generator. They got the small one working, but they couldn't get the big one working. So we, we officially opened it, but we had to close it down again real soon thereafter. On the morning of September 26th, we discovered that uh, north of Smoky Communications were damp. Anyone having fiber op, TV, cellular service, and all emergency services that use the trunk mobile radio service. So our communications for the ambulance, fire, police, Department of Transportation, their radio system, uh, that was down. I know to provide the Provincial Coordination Center at five o'clock that morning via satellite phone that there was an issue and it took a long time to get service back up and operational, but it was possible. Yeah, it turned it turned out it was my uh, my mother's best friend or my my best friend's mother, and she was I used to call her my second mom. So anyway, but anyway, um, it didn't it didn't happen. Um, we couldn't get through to 911. Nobody could get through. We couldn't get through on our radio system. It was about a half hour, 45 minutes before the call came in, before we responded and stuff. The fire department had been notified. There was an RCMP officer across the street. Uh, he went over and they helped out. They did CPR and stuff. But um, it turns out that even if it would have happened, that she would have passed away anyway. So anyway. On September 26th, there were three comfort centers open, Cabot, Ross Ferry, and Big Bidore. Uh, the 27th, there were only two remaining, Ross Ferry and Big Bidore, uh, for Bullingry Island. And they remained open until, I believe it was uh, until September 30th, uh, when they finally got power back and stuff. We got, we got notification that they'd have power back on the 29th, but it was patchy power. It was, uh, this place had power and this place had some, but the majority of Bullingry Island still didn't have power. And uh, so they, we needed to continue to open, have them open. So uh, kudos to both Ross Valley and Bullingry Island. You know, we expect comfort centers to open, we expect them to open. We've never had this in Victoria County to open for more than 24 hours. Um, they were open for four or five days. So, um, a request came in from the village of Bedeck to have the military assist uh, with the Bedeck waterfront. Uh, had an email from, and a phone call from Sandy Hudson, uh, who's the CAO now for the village of Bedeck. CAO, correct? For the uh, village of Bedeck. Um, still waiting to hear on a request from the Provincial Coordination Center. Um, actually, I did hear, and I meant to change this, but I didn't get a chance this morning. Um, actually did hear from the Provincial Coordination Center about 10 o'clock last night. Um, they're so strapped, they're probably not gonna get to help. And Sandy even told me in an email, he said, he said, the damage has mostly been cleaned up anyway. It's now the reconstruction part, so. Uh, we had multiple uh, requests for interviews from the media. Uh, we tried to fulfill most, uh, but if I couldn't fulfill them, I would push them off to uh, the warden and the deputy warden uh, for comments and stuff, so. Uh, it was, it, it, went, it went very well, I think. Um, most times we could at least get our message out and the importance of what was going on. Um, there was a request about a vulnerable person's registry for Victoria County as a result of Hurricane Fiona. This has not been the first question, request that we've had for a vulnerable person's registry. This would have to be okayed and volunteered 
to obviously by the, the members, whoever considers themselves a vulnerable person, because you're crossing a line about breach of patient confidentiality there. So um, there's some hoops to jump through with that, but it certainly is something that we can look, look to, okay? And then again, just mentioned about the Insurance Bureau of Canada, about insurance claims. We were in con constant contact with them. So that's been happening. And there was, there was oodles of questions that were asked of me during the whole two weeks and stuff. Every day, you're putting in 12, 15, 20 hours for the first, basically for three or four days before the storm, and then for at least a week after the storm and stuff. It's slowed down now uh, with everybody with their power back, but uh, it's still, we have conference calls. Our provincial coordination center is still open. If any requests come through to me, they still go to the provincial coordination center and they will remain open till, the, till everybody has at least their power back and stuff. So it could be remain open for a while. This could go on for months and months and months. Um, we were eight years finalizing Salmon River Bridge so when, when the meat clove flood hit, that didn't get finished up until 2018 and the flood happened in 2010. So uh, when there's damage like this, it, it, not everything, everybody thinks, oh yeah, it's over and done with, it's sunny now, everything's over. It's not over for a lot of people. There's people still that have trouble and are years getting back on their feet, okay? So keep that in mind. Uh, we will continue to make sure that problems are solved and people are inquiring about disaster financial assistance arrangements, the DFAA. Um, the paperwork is available online and we will make sure that we have copies here at the county office if anybody wants to come into the county office to actually pick up the paperwork and stuff. So that's available. Just look how massive that is. Yeah, so uh, absolutely, and 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 I'll say I'll say a few things too. We do need we do need some work on our comfort centers, uh, backup power areas and stuff. So. Excellent for taking a while, and once again, thanks for all your work during that. It's uh, like I say, you're well of information, and you're always there when people need it. And uh, I know you're probably affected the whole county, but definitely want to share it. Some of those questions for you, but uh, other than I think you're going to answer regarding that was my question with regards to generators and whatnot. But yeah, we learn from this experience that we may need going forward. And, and I think just, just a statement I think this opened a lot of people's eyes too, and stuff. Um, English couldn't English home hardware couldn't keep generators in stock, and I'm sure the home hardware here in Bedeck was very similar to that. As soon as they get in generators, first day of the storm, there was a there was a truckload that was supposed to come down to home hardware with generators, and the truck said it wasn't coming because of the storm, so they got in their own truck and they went to Sydney to pick them up just to make sure people would have generators for the storm. Okay, thank you, uh, Councilor Mc. And I, I should mention, I should have mentioned this earlier that uh, uh, the CAO uh, Leanne is not available today, and that uh, she'll be back for the next council meeting. We hope so. That she, just wanted to recognize her absence in the uh, minutes as well. My apologies, Councilor McDonald. Yes, thank you, Warden. Thank you, Mr. Dunman, for your presentation. Uh, I can honestly say that uh, communication is the key. There, there's always. Excellent communication, emails to let us know what's going on as things take place. And uh, thankfully, there was little or no damage in District 8. There was a little bit of a road wash out in Capstick area, but that was minimal compared to what other districts have seen. Uh, as in regard for the comfort centers, they had one in the, in Cape North. They just used their own generator. They, they used they used the fire department generator, and it wasn't it wasn't to power and heat the building. Like if we had a power outage in the area, come January, they've got no source of heat. We were lucky that the storm happened when it did, because heat wasn't an issue. Heat is not an issue right now, but that's not to say we're still in the height of hurricane season. Hurricane season is not officially over until December first. We're not out of the woods yet. We're still keeping an eye on two that's in the Gulf Coast right now. 
So in regard to that, just for that area, is that something that the province should be to maybe to have a generator in the northern part, whether that be Big St. Lawrence or Cape North, because Neil's Harbor it, it's, is... It's a municipal responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. For comfort centers, that is a municipal responsibility. Thank you, sir, very much. That's from McLeod. Thank you, Lloyd. Uh, excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, always the communication is great and very clear and in a language that we, we can understand and put it to the to the public. That's very important and it's very clear. Thank you. Uh, do you have, it, maybe it's too early, but any numbers how the uh, comfort centers uh, it went like uh, the people used them there was people using them every day they every said day. every day i was in contact with my counterpart in for not my counterpart my the person who runs the one in big Bedour and the one who runs ross ferry and every day they had people in and okay. stuff so they were used they were. um yeah they were a benefit to have open for sure yeah and i talk about uh specific for me river uh comfort center thing this time we didn't use it, I think, too often. Um, the, it's the same question about the generators. Uh, I know they are asking for that generator for years. Um, if you think we'll be with this experience a little more open help for purchase for our comfort centers? Yeah, I think so. Yeah? Yeah, I think but so. If you have any information, can you just uh, refer that to the comfort centers? Yeah. That would be great. I I think this is the point with the with the disaster financial assistance. In order to qualify for a storm to qualify, it has yeah. to be in excess of three million dollars. Okay. I, I think we far exceeded that, especially with Cape Breton Regional Municipality. Uh, just the manpower alone for all the power companies that are restoring power is going to certainly we've already been awarded the disaster financial assistance. So with that, um, this is more uh, the COOs and the CFOs. Uh, forte when it comes to money, um, but that's we can register through them and request stuff through the DFAA. So, okay. And just one personal question: um, when the storm came across us, was people were saying was in the eye of the storm, but or we get the we we was in the middle or we, the eye the eye was. Typically west of us, it was west of Victoria County. Okay. That's where the eye went up over over the rest in that area. Okay. Um, typically, when a, when an eye a storm passes and the eye is passing, to the right of the storm uh, gets more wind. To the left of the storm gets more rain. The okay. left of the eye and stuff. But this storm was, as you can see, this storm was so massive. Uh, the meteorologist that works with us in Eastern Nova Scotia, he he's actually. Um, environment can the meteorologist but he works at a power office and he said it doesn't matter which side of this which side of the eye he said you're going to get both wind and rain with this one we were very lucky we didn't get as much rain as what they were calling for okay. they, they were calling for anywhere between uh well for us anywhere between 100 and 200 millimeters with the possibility yeah. some forecasts were seeing 260 we only seen 120 millimeters rain so we were very lucky okay thank you Thank you, Councillor McLeod. Councillor Patterson, any? Uh, thank you, Lyle, uh, for all your work. Uh, my issue is, my main issue is, you alluded to it earlier, and I mentioned it when MLA Bain was here, was, was the communication scenario. Um, and I guess the most galling part of that, uh, Nova Scotia Power, for all their faults, I phoned that outage line a hundred times. I always got through and I actually we used our old resolve team uh, number we had. I didn't even know if that still existed. It's called it, it, it is it's, it's I got a live person. It's not advertised, but it goes it goes through it gets called yeah. forward. It. And I spoke to Terry, God love her. She was working eight or twelve hours a day and she was bringing me up to date on what's going on. Bell, on the other hand, and I forget which other company, their chief executives got on and said, we did the best we could. Like, we're proud of what we did. Well, your best is not good enough. You shouldn't be proud of what you did. You cost people or almost cost people's lives. Do you understand that? You know, do they understand that? So what I suggested this morning, and I haven't followed up on it yet, but the last time the phone was out for five or six days, 
I called the call centers regularly and I said, I want a rebate on my phone bill for the time I didn't have my phone. And they gave it to me. So I think if everybody did that, call and say, my phone was out for seven days, I want that taken off my bill. Then they may pay attention and do something about the situation. Doug, this was brought up at the Coordination Center. The province has issued us um, a satellite phone for the municipality for such occurrences, and uh, it is in my possession. Uh, it's outside my mind in the truck. It goes everywhere with me for that reason. Um, I can take it. I even I can take. There's a big case that it's in. Just the phone itself with me, and I even take it to work with me when I'm on the end. It was just just in case something significant happens. I mean, communications. Uh, they do. Bell does have redundant systems. Um, I remember back when the fiber op happened, fiber op break happened years, a few years back, they had a redundant system. And ironically, they had two breaks the same day, one in New Brunswick and one in Quebec. And who ever thought so well, they have a third system in place. For the backup generators, uh, they do have backup generators at all their tower sites uh, that kick in when the power goes out. I think they anticipated been unable to go refuel these, and which which they they did for the majority and stuff, but I don't think they anticipated trains being down to the sites and stuff and getting access to some of the sites. So that was posing some problems. Not in this case. In this case, it actually wasn't. Um, I heard a CBC interview. I didn't hear it. I was told there was a CBC interview today uh, on the radio about. That specific incident, and Bill Lyons said it was uh, the site generator, and it had a malfunction, and it did not have a malfunction because of the hurricane. Because if it would have had a malfunction, then we wouldn't have been able to have cell service up to that morning. And then at nine o'clock that morning, with no service tech in the area, we wouldn't have got the service back. Or ten o'clock that morning, we wouldn't have got the service back. From what I was told by public safety and fire communications, and some of you, uh, some of you were here for our uh, mock exercise that we had. We had people here from that, and they told me it was a Halifax issue. So they're building on fixing the problems. We just don't want to lose nine one one service. Yeah. Okay. It, it's it's terrible. So yeah, just two other quick things. One, we're on a positive note. We're over uh, time now, Fraser. Okay, just, just two quick things. Yep. So the vulnerable registry, I think, is very important. And kudos to the people in the comfort centers. They fed people. They looked after them. Thank God it wasn't cold. Yep, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Being cognizant of the time. No, no. <laughs> Councilor Oregon. We're here to seven, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thanks for all the work you've done. Um, you're talking about the, the new bridge in Fairview. Uh, there's got to be a lot more work done instead of a bridge. And, and you know, like myself, because we live there, the, the other bridge in by the fire hall has to be looked at again. Thank God we didn't have as much rain as they predicted, because that one would, would have went too. As for the comfort sta station, yes, Niels Harbor, we had a little bit of problem because we, we were down working at it, the generator, but for people to go to it, they had to drive substantial. Yes. Yep. So, and people like that were on Fairview, they couldn't get in there anyway, <laughs> the ones that probably needed it the most. So um, it, I'm glad to see that the road is open again. And um, Kudos to the guys, and it was Monday they start work on the the road. Was it? Yes. Monday. Nope. Okay. Monday. Monday. My, my, my correction. <laughs> but anyways, thanks for all the updates and, and everything. Hopefully, we won't have to do this again. Okay. Anytime soon, anyway. Yeah. Councillor Longa. Uh, thank you, Lyle, for your report. Uh, very good report. Mm. 
very sorry for the loss of your your friend there too Thank you. um thanks for uh, keeping us well informed during the hurricane and during the aftermath and for getting always getting what needs to be done done it's always a pleasure to speak with you because you're always so personable easy to talk to i talked to you a lot more in the last storm <laughs> we had lots of damage that time but this time my district got off easy um i had a couple of questions just the tmr system being down like why like why was it down is that something that can be prevented in the future from it being down or well the, the, the province is looking at to make sure that this type of thing they improve every time there's an issue and i don't know it's electronic it's on electronic equipment and as long as we have electronic equipment there's always going to be some fault. They'll put four in and three will break. They'll put a fourth in, four will break. I don't think it'll ever be foolproof, but it'll certainly help with our chances of not having an issue again. Yeah, and uh, another thing that was mentioned was like street lights that are, we don't have to deal with that here in our area, but a, a lot of places have street lights and they're completely out like with nothing and just wondering in the future if that's something else that they would at least have flashing lights or something be, because there's like people are used to having lights and then all of a sudden there's like no lights at all. Uh, so that was just a concern that someone mentioned to me. Um, also, generators, like you mentioned, uh, the North Shore, there didn't, there, one of their generators wasn't working, and was it, it, you guys had a generator problem, would there be funding for those places that are going to be uh, comfort centers in the future, like funding for them to get new generators? And last but not least, the Rec Hove store closed during the whole thing because like they were just trying to keep their frozen food and stuff uh you know with the generators they had but brent said to me in the future that he would be more than willing to be stay open you know for a lot of things that people need if uh if he, he was helped in being a comfort center that he would be willing to do that but that with the echo general store is one of two locations that does have backup power for fuel. Uh, it's the next fuel station in Dunwall. They have backup power for fuel as well. Um, we are going to um, in Victoria County. Uh, basically, a working deal with uh, the emergency services that he will maintain most of his fuel because he only has a small tank now. It's above ground tank. Most of it for emergency services. And stuff, fire companies and ambulance. Um, so for Joe Smith to walk down to get gas can for fuel might not happen. But certainly until he loses his stock or or he sells out of whatever equipment, he certainly is willing to keep that. But he does, he does need better power for that area. Mm -hmm. uh, stuff. He's just using portable generators yeah. and stuff. Thank you very much. And uh, Councillor McNeil has, has uh, joined us. Just to give him a moment to get settled if you have any quick questions. I, I just to wrap up, uh, Lyle, I want to thank you very much on behalf of the residents of Victoria County and Council as well for the excellent job you did for the last couple of weeks. We keep going back to that, but uh, I don't think most people realize the time that you put into this. And uh, we're very fortunate to have you and, and uh, just uh, from all of the residents and council, thank you very much for, for doing what you do. We, I, don't, I don't know what we'd do without you. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm going to go to Council McNeil first. So, so what you pay me the big bucks for? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, <laughs> we want to, we're well over time and it's important and it was most uh, informative what you provided, but I just want to, uh, Council McNeil, uh, the, um, uh, Lyle has gone over and showed us a number of pictures and brought us through the process. <laughs> so if there's any quick comments that you have uh, just prior to, and then I'll give the last comment to Councillor McLeod. Thank you, Warden, and I apologize for being late. I was at a ceremony in Wagwaku. <laughs> so, uh, no, I just wanted to thank uh, you, Lyle, for all the hard work you've done. Actually, we were spared in, in my district, uh, basically. But uh, I... I was on the phone with you the day before. Yep. And I, I knew you would be available if something would happen. So, so uh, thank you for all that. 
the last few storms. So. And, and kudos to all of you. All of you, all of you do. And this, this is not to keep thanking this up. This is my job. You know what I'm saying? You're doing your job. But all of you are very willing to take questions from the public and you don't know the answer to get into it. And all of you check in on every place as individuals. So kudos to you for doing that. And I want to thank all the like all the first responders and the power work uh, the with Nova Scotia Power and the, and the different public works. Yeah, the, the, our own public works. Actually, we uh, we only lost the power for basically a day and a half over in Iona. There, there were residents that had the power out for for three or four days, but uh, that that was to be considered that uh, they were working on trying to get the major lines going. So. But there will be individual pockets of people. And, and this is just a suggestion to council as well. Notify your public, even if the power goes in, to make that phone call and say, I don't have power. Because it might be just your line from your power pole to your house. And if you don't know this, don't notify your social power. Everybody else may be on around you. And if they don't know that your power is it, they will call it. So everybody who has a power, you should be calling that bar and then they have that. Councilor McLeod. Just fast. Uh, just to clarify, for the generators, uh, the comfort centers could, with that funding that you say the province is going to give or is giving, uh, the comfort centers can contact you and ask, you know, make the application and you coming with municipality and municipality apply for them. I think this is more of the Alex question. I don't know who is, uh, I don't know. I'm not aware of what's the province has included in their okay. in their funding the, relief. I would think there, generators there is, not. And it's not part of the disaster financial assistance fund, but it is in the two hundred thousand dollars that the premier has for the additional two hundred thousand dollars. He put two hundred thousand okay. dollars in for generators for comfort centers and stuff like that. He made that public. Okay. So, well, what, yeah. once we get more information on, it's we can we can share it as we well. Need, we need to find more information. Okay. Yes. If you have any information, can you just uh, yes. send it to me? Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Just one last thing before we uh, we leave. The last time we had a major outage like this, we provided uh, some small amount of funding and a grant to uh, some of the halls that uh, operated comfort centers. So, uh, thinking if we were to to uh, offer a grant to them of $500 to cover some of their costs while they were open and to the ones that were open and they are listed and we know who they are. So but perhaps a motion to that effect if council is in agreement. So warden would you want those to come out of our district budget? So no, it'll come out of our special funding. Yeah, I was thinking of a figure of $500 out of my district budget. But yeah, and it'll come out of our uh, council special project pot. A little letter of appreciation to the volunteers. We Absolutely. Them all, of course, yep. but sure. there were people there basically 12 hours yep. a day. Too. Yeah. hundred percent. thousand percent. Yep. No. And we have to recognize them. And they, anyway, they didn't do it for recognition. They did it as a sense of community. So we have a motion to that effect, please. I'm sorry that we contributed a $500 grant to any of the community halls or fire departments that open comfort centers during uh, the state of emergency and uh, whatever length was required during Hurricane Fiona. And we also include a letter of appreciation. When being also a letter of appreciation would be included with that check. It's moved by uh, Councillor Patterson. Do we have a seconder for that, please? Yeah. Second by Councillor Oregon. All in favor? <laughs> Andre reminded. Motion's carried. Uh, thanks again, Lyle. We appreciate it as always. We're going to take a 10 minute break and we'll reconvene at 25 minutes after three. Thank you.
So welcome back to Victoria County Council's meeting for October 4th. Our next item on the agenda, Alex Redden, our Chief Financial Officer, is uh, going to do a short presentation on the grant process and provide some recommendations with that. So we'll turn it over to Alex, please. Thank you. Okay, thanks for having me. I just have a quick presentation here that I'm going to go through. So just the uh, background or origin of why I'm here. So at the August 22nd council meeting, which was in Inganish, um, it came up to look into the current municipal grant policy and the structure of the policy. And a request came for staff to look at, at the current policy and make a recommendation on whether it, it should continue as is or whether there are any changes that need to be made. Um, the policy is also, it's written in the policy to review it every two years. And as you'll see, we first approved it in 2020. So the review of this is actually really timely. So it's good. So just the, the background of how we got to the existing policy as it is right now. So in late 2019, early 2020, uh, the county undertook a process to completely revise the grant structure, the policy document and the application process. So there was a extensive research from policies from other municipalities, both neighboring municipalities and across Nova Scotia. And there were several meetings with staff and council uh, virtually to discuss these options. So in March, 2020, the new municipal grant policy was approved. In November, 2021, the policy was revised and we included the property tax relief grant in there as its own uh, grant stream where previously it was under uh, its own separate bylaw and, and discussions said that it made more sense to include it as part of this overall policy. Um, so the whole intent of the revisions to th what the policy is today was to provide a framework that was based on fairness and equality to try to streamline the process for three different parties, for applicants, for staff, for council, and just to make sure that year over year we're being consistent, if we have staff changeover, if we have council turnover, that we're always applying the same methodologies to awarding grants. So the current policy as it exists right now, it has four categories of grants that are under council's full decision-making authority. Um, if you get into the policy, you'll see there's also a, a section on tourism and recreation related grants, but that's in, in um, that's working with the, the, the new um, department that we have. Um, so these four ones are, are under uh, council specifically. So, and the applications for these four streams are reviewed and approved as part of the annual budgeting process. So the four streams are development grants, capital grants, operational grants, and now property tax relief grants. So the current policy states that only one application per community organization may be submitted in each fiscal year for each funding category. However, applications should pertain to separate and distinct projects, programs, and initiatives. So I have, I have an example later on on, on how this might, might apply to an organization. Um, and then within the policy, there's an appendices for each grant category, and it states what the objective and what the limitations are for each funding category. For each funding category. So that's the, yeah. So I, I, have a, um, I have an example in here on, in how uh, this could relate to a specific organization. So, um, okay. Okay, so the, the discussion on this, um, the current policy would is designed with ma two main benefits in mind. One, it was to create a one-stop shop style for organizations to apply where it's just one form. You find that one form at a certain time of the year, you submit all your asks at once and you submit, well, there might be a separate form for each funding stream, but still it's, it's the same form for every ask. The second benefit is from an internal perspective is that all asks are received by council all at one point in time. So council can fully understand the financial needs of the community and the organizations within community. And then as a whole, applications can be looked at 
both on an individual basis and looking at all the applications all at once. And this is done at one point in time rather than throughout the year having another one and another one, another one, and not, and as you know, that impacts the budget. Um, uh, uh, there is a pot available through the budgeting process and it's, it's, if you receive them throughout the year, it's hard to know what to anticipate. So the various categories, the four that I listed, they allow for year-to-year -year flexibility for the changing needs of community organizations. And it lets us place specific limitations on categories. So as an example up here, I have for operational, we've limited that you can't ask for more than $10,000 for operational funding. But when you're talking about capital, $10,000 might not cut it for some, for some capital projects. So there's a maximum of $25,000 for that funding category. So just like as an example of how this can apply. So under the current policy, picture a community hall that's in any of your districts, they could submit four separate applications. So they could submit an operational grant to say that they need help with their heating expense. And I would say it's likely that they would ask for this annually. We often see operational grant requests come in from the same organizations every year. Then they could also ask for a property tax relief grant for the hall that the property's on. And again, it's likely that you'll see this come every year from the same organizations. They could also ask for a capital grant to support a major roof replacement on that hall. It has a start and an end date. It's a one-time ask to just finish that project. And then say that that community hall also has a, a summer music event being held at that hall. They could ask for a developmental grant for that event. And again, this is a start and an end date, so it's a one-time ask. So under the existing policy, all of these would be valid asks. So then it comes down to council to evaluate the applications on an individual basis, but also collectively against all the applications that have been received throughout the year. And the policy does have evaluation criteria for each funding stream. Um, and when I said the appendices that are, are in the back of the policy, each one does have, um, does have Criteria. So, I mean, it's small to see on this screen, I know, but this is just an example of what's what's in the back of the policy for an operational grant. Just, hmm? all the questions for, for the Could it be easier? I, I only have one slide left, so okay. yeah, we can just okay. wrap it up. Okay. Yeah. So the staff recommendation that, that I'm putting forward um, is that we maintain the policy with separate funding application streams as it currently is. But we just work towards enhancing the application evaluation process to make sure that grants are evaluated and award, awarded based on the criteria that's in the appendices of these policies. Um, and, and that's how we enhance the process. So we're going to open to questions. So I'm going to start with uh, Fraser and then come to Jackie. So go ahead, Fraser. Thank you, Warren. Uh, yes, Alex, we, we discussed uh, during the break that phrase one time in the development and I see what it means now. Mm -hmm. it, it first of all threw me off. It sounds like you'd already applied for one. Uh, if an organization submits four grants or four applications, should we maybe ask them to prioritize them? It's an option. You know, I mean it might be a way of like you, your wishes and your needs, right? You need heat, for example, but you may not need that other item that you're putting an application for. It's just a thought. I don't know if it would be. I think it would be helpful to council because then we could say, well, we only have so much money. We'll give you your top two, but you'll have to wait for the other two. It's an option. I mean, changes at this point, I think, are, are changes the council is going to bring forward in, in the process. So it's, it's certainly something that can be considered. I think it would work on an individual basis, but then when you're evaluating them all collectively, it, it could get a little dicey. Yeah. And then, so it, it does come down to council's final decision, whether we approve them or not. Oh, absolutely. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Okay, and thank you. Just a point of further clarification, and I asked Alex, is you can apply for all four, you may get all four, and not to the amount that you expect, or you may not get any, it just, that's a decision to council. Council Oregon. Uh, the one time ask, Alex, uh, like for the music thing, does that mean one time ask for that year? 
Yeah, uh, Fraser also had this comment. Yeah. The, the one time ask wording, I think I've can So they can people. do it year after year after year after year. So the way the developmental grant stream is worded, it's for events that are music or seniors related. Like there's different categories and they would be they would be one time events in that there's a start date and there's an end date. Many events like that happen on an annual basis. So they come in annually, yes, but it's it's a different it's a different application because you're talking about a different event. So yes, I say one time, Cabot Trail Relay is a one time event during that year. Are they going to ask for money every year? Yes, probably. Anybody have any question? Any other questions? Uh, Deputy Ward. Put in two or three next year. So this is going to balloon. And I guess my concern is I'm seeing the amount of money we're putting out increasing each year. It's getting more and more. We have certain organizations that are totally reliant on us now that never were before. They were self-sustainable and now they're not self-sustainable because they've increased and done. It's great that they've done it, but don't get me wrong, but where does it end? So my concern is that someone comes and they apply for four uh, and they get four different grants. It's taken a huge percentage of our budget and it's not being shared evenly around the whole municipality. Uh, that's why I think it should be two things. You do one, everyone should have the right to go for the tax relief. And one other, I, I don't think some, it should be open to everyone. So you make a decision, what's most important to you? Like Fred said, you prioritize. What's more important to you this year is the operational or is it the development or the capital? Um, because I can see this just exploding. Uh, like I say, just based on the two that, I, that approached me already, they're starting to realize that all these grants are there. And what are we gonna do when everyone applies for four and we've got $3 million in ask and we got 200,000 to give out. Um, that's why I'd like to see it brought back that you have the right to do for the tax relief and one other. So they make the decision instead of it all following on us, because what happens if we, we deny one, then we're the bad guys, right? So to me, it should be up to them. They make their decision what they want to apply for. And then the decision is made based on that. And that's just my opinion. And I can see that point, but I still see situations where an organization can totally val validly mm -hmm. apply for three. And, and I know that funds are limited and there is a pot decided on every year, but I feel like restricting it to one, it, it might backfire in that sometimes you do need to give more, especially when things align with strategic priorities of council. So like I'm, I think of snowmobile clubs, mm -hmm. yeah. like the trail and trails in general. I mean, that's yeah. a, a, a big thing right now. But again, that's a priority of council. That's right, right, but maybe there is an operational and a capital grant this year, but then that's not a priority of council five years from now. Exactly. But so, I, I think we're, we're, we're creating reliance on us right. uh, from a lot of organizations that were self-sustainable before. Now they're not. They're not fundraising. They're not doing certain things because they're relying on us to give them money. And what's going to happen, say, next year, some of these organizations say, sorry, you don't qualify this year. Right. They're, you know, they've lost their self-sustainable ability, and I think we're we're feeding them too much. And not that I don't want to see the organization. I just want to see it fairly put out over the county instead of certain organizations getting every year, getting the same amount more and more and more. Right. And, but that again, I think is where the evaluation criteria comes in because financial need is their demonstrated effort to seek other funding sources. Yeah. But it, most don't. For sure. But that's in the policy that that is an evaluation yeah. criteria. So yeah. if we really look at what's written in there, and hold organizations to some of that, you're not the bad guy. In my opinion, you're not. You're not. It, it's written in policy that's approved by council. But again, going back to the policy, can we get clarification? What is a generally delivered service of a municipality? Like what, what is, like, I'm looking at a bunch of them and I'm saying, well, that's really not a, is it a municipal responsibility? Right. Honestly, that wording comes from the MGA. Yeah. 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 It does. Yeah, I can understand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, I just think we're people are getting way too dependent on us. And, and I, I totally agree with helping all the organizations. 
but it gets to a point that we're, we're only hindering the organization because we're making themselves reliant on us. I, and just if I could weigh in on a second, I think we did that this year, staff compiles it, what, what criteria and how close they met the criteria that we have. Yeah. So it's shortlisted almost before we get it as, uh, or it's, there's certain recommendations there, they're weighted before we get them, so to speak, as far as what criteria they meet, or is that something that you could do? Uh, well, this year they all went to council first, uh, all okay. at once. So that was the change this year. But when they, part of the application process, we were able to reference. Uh, yeah. That right, met. that was if they met like the limitations. Exactly. Right, we could take that a, another level. I That's guess. what I'm thinking. Right. Like, so we capture it there and then put in the extra considerations that's required. Right. Like the first round of applications that was done is if it's capital, you only are allowed to claim one third. If you ask for 75%, You're not it was kidding. cut back to, to one yep. third per the policy. It stopped at those. Yep. So it, it could be another level. Councilor McLeod. Okay. So I just want to try to understand, um, you do the evaluation about the policy, but really nothing changed, right? That's your recommendation. Mm -hmm. Keep it like I, like I last year. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I understand what uh, uh, Larry say about, it's in the policy where they say, you say like uh, you apply today, 2021, in 22, you know what to get it. Always, you can put that solution like a, you can apply for every year. It, or it's up to it currently says you can apply every year every year yeah. but could be if we put you no know, every consecutive year at least give a break to another organizations to ask for money right and then you have that evaluation to make it clear like uh, you maybe you're not going to get a three or three or four the grants in that in that in that year but the another one is a tax relief mm -hmm. i think that will be could be different because is that annually? Like I, I don't see it going with it with the same policy with the court for them because they had to apply for the same, right? That they have to apply every evaluation had to apply for organization have to apply every year for the tax relief. Mm -hmm. If they are asking for a capital and operation and tax relief and then um, develop it, we're going to give it a four. If they're up, if they're covering the same in the same evaluation, it will be up to us. Up, but, uh, yeah. It's up to council to decide. Yeah, and, and I mean, when we did look at grants this year, even though the application form was the same, the property tax ones we separated out and we looked at those because the application form is the same, but yeah. it's still it's two pots of money or two separate budget line items. There's the community organization okay. grants, and then there's the property tax relief line. Okay. But yeah, I, I understand what you want to say. Like, uh, I don't know if we could just, it's not for consecutive, you can apply every year, like uh, every two years or every three years. I don't know if council will be okay with that because that way you give a chance to another, another organization to apply, right? Or maybe they are not going to apply any, anymore because, you know, and they can figure out if they're sustainable or not sustainable. I don't know. I'll go with the the I, I think that, and I'm sorry, and I, but I'm thinking that, for example, uh, Alex mentioned the cabinetry relay. Like that would mean if we didn't, if we gave them last year, we couldn't give them this year. So I, I don't know how we get around that, but I, I think it kind of goes back to what Alex said earlier. You can apply for all four. That doesn't mean you're going to get all four, and we have to and we have to evaluate. And I think if if one of the criteria we decide to look at, if you've got two, then maybe you don't get three and four unless it's really exceptional circumstances. So it's it's a tough one to it's a tough. Councilor McNeil. Yeah, it's tough. Uh, yeah. Even if they're not really wanting or at the moment in that uh, particular criteria, they're applying. 
yeah, I'm just saying that organizations won't, uh, aren't getting the money from the provincial and federal governments the way they used to. So automatically they'll they'll try to find a way to apply for for all four or all, like three areas to get the extra money that they would have got from the federal and provincial governments. And uh, like I said, at one point, if they were getting the extra money from federal and provincial, they wouldn't be applying for all three. But now it seems like they will. And it won't give the other organizations throughout the, 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 the county the opportunity. So, I mean, for capital projects in particular, it, it still only is up to a third. So yeah. if they are spending the money as they've requested it, they still should be getting two thirds somewhere that's not municipal money. Yeah. Uh, just just on uh, Councillor McNeil's point, this year we were able to we didn't turn anybody down zero, did we? Or yes, we did. I guess when they applied for more than one. Mm -hmm. Okay, that those, those are the only ones. Uh, as we said, it's difficult. Um, again, if we ask them to prioritize them, they have to think about what really they're applying for. I mean, it's easy just to fill out the application, send it in. But if you have to put a priority number on it, you're going to pause and say, well, do we really need that this year? Do we, you know, what we'd rather have or better service? That might be a way of filtering out. And then, of course, we have the final say. We don't have the money. We don't have the money. And, uh, you know, that's the final control on the whole, the whole uh, application process. And... For the most part, we were able to fund most organizations this year to uh, a satisfactory level. Anyway, it might not have been all they wanted, but they got something. So I, I'd say we try one more year and see how the applications go. And if they're, we're overwhelmed with them, well, we'll have to deal with that uh, when we- So am I understanding you? We're accepting your recommendation. That's your suggestion. We accept I, I, this recommendation. I, I would say, Bruce, right now, because yeah. we don't, there's so many unknowns. We yeah. don't know how many applications we're going to get next year. We may get less. Yeah. And we know. just changed the grant criteria last two years, two years two ago. Years ago. Yeah. 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 So it's probably, yeah, give us some extra time to do an evaluation. Move that we accept. I'm just uh, going to say any further discussion on revised okay. Alex or, or amended grant policy. What do you want to call it? Uh, there were no amendments. My, so my recommendation. recommendation was to so it's just reaffirming, it, reaffirming the grant policy we have at present. Just one other thing yep. though the policy it says to look at it every two years, mm -hmm. but in, in that case, maybe we should look at it again next year. Yeah. Anyway, yep. look at any, so we'll make that subtle change. I would add that to the motion, yeah. And okay, you, you'll, the you'll add that to your motion, the policy be reviewed on an annual basis. Yeah. So, and we accept the uh, recommendation from the Chief Financial Officer in regards to uh, evaluation of operational grants. We have a seconder for that. It's been moved by Councilor Patterson, seconded by Councilor Longo. All in favor? Contrary minded? Yeah. Motion's carried. Thank you very much, Alex. We have one name. What? Who nay? Oh, sorry. Uh, let the record show that uh, Deputy Ward Daphne was opposed to the. Uh... <laughs> All right, we're going to move on to the uh, minutes of our August 22nd minutes. They have been circulated to you. You've had a chance to review them. Are there any errors or omissions in those minutes? Hearing none, we have a motion to accept. Sorry, a correction. I'm sorry, you did mention that. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, so this, this the, the motion last time was sort of sale that we could sell land. 
Um, I'm saying that it's got to be a little more broader than that. It's not just to sell land because we may not want to sell it. We may want to lease the land. Uh, uh, it's whatever we need to encourage housing. So it's more than just a sale. So I just want to make that correction on it. So perhaps use as a resource? As a resource and at the discretion of uh, our uh, management or uh, administration. Administration. So I'm not, and we have to rescind that motion, do we? Or was the motion probably would, would we, I think? No, just the wording, it's just the word sale is the only thing I need changed. It's just that my, my intent in the, in the motion was that okay. it be used for to encourage housing. And that may not be to sell the land, it could be to lease the land. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh, I'm fine with so that. So, would you, would you make a motion to rescind that motion? I make a motion to rescind the motion. And who seconded that? I don't know. Uh, Council Oregon. Would you second, second that it. rescinding of that motion? All in favor? Uh, Contrary minded? Motion's carried, and that motion is rescinded. And the new motion is the new motion is is that we, yeah, of course, I lost it there. Um, is that we add the uh, municipal property for resources as a resource? Perfect. You have a seconder for that. Should be the seconder that I'll second it. Thank you, Councilor Organ. All in favor. Contrary minded, motion is carried. Thank you very much. So anything else in those error or errors or omissions in those minutes? Hearing none, can we have a motion to accept the minutes of August 22nd, 2022 with the noted correction? Thank you. It's been moved by the deputy warden. Do we have a seconder, please? Second by Councilor McNeil, all in favor? Aye. Contrary minded, motion is carried. We're going to move on to the CAO's report. It's going to be provided by um, the Chief Financial Officer in the absence of the CAO this afternoon. Okay, so Leanne sent out her report. I'm just going to go over some of the things that are in it. Um, and sorry, before I get into that, um, related to the generator funding, um, I was talking to Leanne. So there was $2 million, $2 million for community centers uh, to purchase and install generators. So the details of how to apply for it aren't out yet. Um, so I would tell community groups or community centers to watch for details on that. And when we get them, we'll send them to the counselors to, to share with their districts. Um, okay, so bathroom signage, um, it should be here in two to three weeks time. It was held up from material and also because of the hurricane. Uh, there was a, a meeting with MLA Bain today um, held here in council chambers. There was uh, approximately 30 members of the public in attendance. The upland meeting with council was held on September 12th. So if you have any comments or concerns, make sure that you get those in. Uh, the signage for street name changes was sent off to AMANs who are compiling ideas. It seems like there's a 50-50 split on who should be paying for that. Uh, Councillors were sent the ad for the UARB rate study hearing, which has been sent. So that's on November 29th. Uh, Leanne is setting, working on setting up an, or I don't know if Leanne is, someone is working on setting up an island-wide uh, warden and mayor's meeting. For Fishing Gear Coalition End of Life Project, fish people can take their end of life gear to sites at no charges from September to March, 2023. Uh, with uh, DNN, DNRR dealing with Councillor McDonald's issues, Dingwall beach metal and dredging material has been removed. And White Point land, we're moving forward with this and we're looking at an environmental assessment. Uh, some of the things that the departments have been working on, um, I just gave my grant recommendation on the, the grant policy. Um, for a tax update, I won't go through the whole thing, but um, as of today, we're at 2,400,000, nope, sorry, 2,048,478 compared to 2.2 million this time last year. So we are $189,000 ahead. Um, so still good news story, still in, on the right side and, and go always going in the right direction. Uh, just a reminder about the next tax sale. The date is set for November 22nd and it's at the Inbury again and it's going to be starting at 11 a.m. So this is a change. The tax sale always historically, I think started at two o'clock just with the amount of people potentially in attendance and the 
high number of bids and the lots of cash to count at the last one, we're, we're going to have it earlier. So it's going to be at 11 a.m. Um, December 11th? On uh, November 22nd. November 22nd. Yeah. yeah. So, and then the details of the properties available will be out very soon on, a, on our website. Uh, for public works, uh, there was waterline repairs to complete in Dingwall and in Neils Harbor. So thanks to the residents there for their patience. Uh, the transfer stations are accepting storm debris with no tipping fees until the end of day on October 8th. We needed to apply for an environmental approval to do this. Uh, just some stats from Kelly. In the first three days, there was 42 metric tons of trees delivered to Bedeck. Another 57,000 pounds came in on Monday of tree and branch debris, and she estimates another 40 to 50% on top of that from the Dingwall site. So there are, there's a lot of, of trees and debris being dropped off at, at the sites. With tourism and recreation, um, you met the, the full department today. So the new staff orientation and training is taking place. Uh, working on the tourism strategy, placemaking project, placemaking and funding projects. Um, the new tourism and development coordinator was out to a few Hike the Highlands events. There was about 40 people in attendance there. Uh, Waterfront Bedeck tunes on the town has been going really well. And the new wharf on Kidston Island is being installed. Uh, in for community development uh, in Dingwall, concrete was poured for garbage cans, bench, basketball court, and the picnic shelter. In Inganish, a steering group for the Inganish Development Society is formed and it's working. Work is underway to finalize the license agreement between parks and the society. And Tunes on the Town also took place in Inganish over the last couple of weeks. Uh, for trails, Cabot Club is working on a new trail into Inganish and it's gone to RFP for a consultant on, an, on the ARIA re, um, report they have to do. Uh, our ARIA findings were sent to ACOA and based on that, there's just two small areas that have to, have to change in the route. Um, updates are going out to local groups and clubs and land use agreements for private owners, surveying the final route and sending out RFPs for the next phases soon. Uh, senior safety, uh, the draft accessibility plan is done and it'll, the, it'll go to the AAC in the near future, accessibility committee, aging and accessibility committee. Uh, the EDO, um, Erica participated in municipal engagement sessions for the Nova Scotia housing needs with CoLab. Uh, she had preliminary meeting with prospective rapid housing project in Bullandry. Uh, met with the new project manager in Cape Smoky. Um, the economic impact RFP closed on September 29th. And uh, re-engaging with BIDEC and businesses on labor and housing survey. And then just a couple of other items. Um, be setting up a meeting soon for a new site for the Secan washroom. Uh, we've also been approved for PCAP funding to replace the Dingwall water tower. So we received up to $140,000 there for projects, um, approximately $550,000. So not full funding, but a contribution nonetheless. Um, MGA review on electronic notices, planning documents, selling and leasing properties. Um, comments from John Bain were circulated. Um, they're due back this week. So just looking to find out if there's any issues that are to discuss based on what was sent out. And if not, can we move forward with, with submitting those comments? I guess that's a question. So at the end of that chance, just take a nice quick look at that. Um, a lot of areas we don't have any plans. So take a second look. And okay. if we don't hear anything like private. I think they're due at the end of this week. So I think the sooner the better, I would say. Yeah. We don't have any by Thursday. We don't. We haven't sent any by Thursday. We're okay. Great. Okay, your mic wasn't on. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll ask you to complete that by Thursday. If you have no comments, we'll forward that uh, survey back as um, provided by the information of John B. Is this for the zoning meeting for, for all Victoria County? 
No. So this oh. was a MGA review. It's talking okay. about electronic notices. Oh, okay. Um, it, it's a survey and it had a lot of check boxes and, and John Bain wrote some comments on it. So sorry about that. I was yeah. thinking of John Bain and planning. It's getting late in the day. My apologies, but it was sent to you and it is there as a, just a check box. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Destination Cape Breton is asking uh, Victoria County to contribute to the development of affordable housing by offering land. And Hurricane Fiona, obviously, I should have said this while Lyle was still here, but thanks to Lyle for giving updates around the county and for all of his hard work. Um, from HR, we'll have a, a job advertisement up very soon for a, a new communications person. So you'll see that in the coming days. And then the, the last thing is um, just, we need a motion um, related to funding that we received. So uh, the motion would be Victoria County supports the application of the ACOA funding for assistance under the Regional Innovation Ecosystem Program to develop a public space and to support events and attract people to the main street in Inganish. So- We have a motion to that effect, please. Move that. Thank you, Deputy Warden. Do we have a seconder, please? Second it. Seconded by Councilor Longo, all in favor? Time to remind it, motion is carried. And that's all that's in Leanne's report. Any questions for Alex in regards to, we'll go with Councillor McNeil and then to Councillor Oregon. Councillor McNeil. Sorry about that. Uh, I know last year we applied for PCAP money for the second well uh, for Little Nares and we were denied. Uh, did we apply again for PCAP money for that? Or We we didn't. So with, with PCAP, you're most likely to get it if it's urgent and it's a small pot of money. And we've been told that repeatedly. So uh, not to say that the Little Hairs project isn't urgent, but the Dingwall project has urgency. Like the, the life of the tank is less than two years. Um, but that, that Little Hairs project has been built into the water rate study. Yeah, but um, no, we did not. Right, and I mean, if, if the next call comes and the project hasn't been started, we can look at it. I'm just not sure that given the small pot of money that we'd be successful. Council Oregon. Uh, the, the tree uh, removal program, uh, how hard would that be to extend it maybe for another week? Uh, a lot of trees down, uh, as you know, in district seven. And uh, with few contractors around, they're hard to come by to, to get these trees removed uh, to put into our transfer facility. I'm sure it's possible. I'll, I'll check with Kelly to be sure. I don't want to just say that without getting her approval, but I, I would think it would be fine. We were waiting for a, a report from a recommendation from staff before we made a decision. Okay. Yeah, I Thanks. think you guys started later down there than we did here. So it will depend on site to site and depending on the information that, and then uh, okay. Alex will get back to you. If you could get that information to me as, as soon as possible. Yeah. Sure. We'll, Thank you. We'll get it in the next couple of days. We'll get that. Thanks. Great. Councillor Longa. Uh, yeah, I, I noticed on her report that she mentioned Mosier limestone and the quarry remediation, but um, there wasn't any details about. Oh, uh, okay. That the letter was sent. And then also, oh no, this is in the minutes about the street light. I think that was in the minutes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else before we I move on? To come on. Uh, you mentioned Destination Cape Breton. Uh, is Terry Smith scheduled on our agenda sometime to regarding the marketing levy? Sorry? Okay. Thank you. We're supposed to come here September 26th, but we canceled uh, him because of the weather. Yeah. Uh, definitely scheduled. 
Thank you for uh, providing that report, Alex. Uh, we're not going to bother with the recess. We're going to go to district concerns. Councilor, what? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't write that in on this one. I'll but... be quick. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I attended a board and committee meeting of the FCM in Edmonton uh, the week of the September 12th. Uh, these issues are nothing new. But first of all, I just like to state that the FCM is basically a lobbying uh, organization. And Carol Saab, uh, the CEO, won the award for the best lobbyist on Parliament Hill. Mm -hmm. So that'll show you what respect we have. Us sitting around this table have in Ottawa. We have a voice in Ottawa directly to the levers of government. Uh, policing, nothing new. Alex and I and Leanne are looking at uh, providing more information because they were interested of the effect of this on small municipalities like us. And, uh, you know, we'll get that out there. Infrastructure applications. Discussion was held on that. And apparently a lot of them are sitting on desks either in Ottawa or Halifax and nothing is moving on them. So I don't know, uh, I haven't mentioned it to MLA Dane yet, but I think we should make an effort to find out where, I think we have three in Alex Dewey. Uh, I don't have them with me now. One for trail, one for Two, active living maybe, yeah. The trails one is federal funding. Yes. So that would definitely be sitting that federally. Would be Ottawa, yeah. And we haven't heard anything That's as right. far as I'm concerned, or yeah. as far as I've heard, nothing. So across the country, it's the same situation. Right. People are pretty convinced that they're sitting on somebody's desk. Right. And then we have the ICIP application yeah. in. Uh, the province has done their part. It's gone on to the feds and we're, exactly. we're waiting. Yeah. yeah. Um, and anyway, and then broadband and, and cellular. And I forwarded information uh, to the board regarding the situation we had last week. Uh, the CRTC really has to step in here and, and do something about the situation. It's drastic. Um, we also met as an Atlantic caucus from Nova Scotia, PEI in Newfoundland and had a very interesting discussion uh, on inclusion and diversity, which of course, as we all know, is a, not a topic of the day, but a, a very important concern for a lot of people. So uh, it was uh, very beneficial. Uh, it gives us uh, a voice, you know, I keep saying, it's hard to believe that the eight of us around this table, uh, you know, have that voice in Ottawa. And uh, anyway, I'd like to thank council for their support in this endeavor. And uh, hopefully there will be some uh, results from those lobbying efforts. Thank you, Warden. Thank you for the report, Fraser. Appreciate it. We move on to district concerns and you may as well continue any district concerns in district five. Okay, just one word. Uh, I understand we don't have a dog catcher in the South. I don't recall being officially notified of that fact, but uh, anyway, apparently we don't. So what are the plans for uh, hiring a new dog catcher? So we've been discussing with the union about changing the position um, and evolving from just a, a dog catcher model to a bylaw enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, the position is unionized. So we've been through MLR meetings, having those conversations. Um, and I would expect you'll see something soon related to that. It um, wouldn't have to wait for negotiations for it, Alex. No, 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 we're, we're talking about it right now. Um, oh, and, and also Terry Hogan is covering uh, dog catching across the county right now. So if, in, in if the there meantime. is an issue, he can be contacted. No. Thank you. So Councilor McLeod, did you have? Uh, because I have that question and because somebody called me and uh, Terry Hogan was, is doing the job right now for mm -hmm. North and South. Yes. And the, uh, the phone number is in the website in animal control. So if anybody calls for about that. Thank you. And just to clarify our previous uh, animal control officer did retire. Mm -hmm. So that's why the position is vacant. Uh, District concern, or no, are, is that it for you, Grace? Comment on. Uh, Go ahead. 
the animal control. I mean, it, isn't it a bit uh, ridiculous for us to expect Mr. Hogan to drive from New Haven to Big Bedeck or, or Bollinger on a report of a dog that's off leash somewhere. And then he gets there after two and a half hour drive or a two hour drive. And I mean, yeah, no, I, I wouldn't disagree with you, but we're just in that transitioning between uh, the, the retirement and the filling of the position. It's short term. Yes. And uh, years ago, before we went to two, that we had one dog catcher for the whole. And, and that's why we went to two. But now it's going to be reevaluated and uh, we'll be hearing about that. So for the short term, it's probably what we'll be dealing with, unless you know something I don't. I would say we're very close to the transition taking another step. We uh, like, I know we retired, but I didn't know we retired until about a month, a month and a half ago, two months ago. And we weren't informed and he retired in January <laughs> or I guess it was January, December. So, like, I honestly didn't know he retired until about until about a month and a half ago. So, yeah, yeah. Hey, we'll note. We'll make note of that. Thank you. Is that it for you in District Five today, sir? Thank you, District. Seven. I almost said six. Sorry, it's getting late, as I said. <laughs> um, after Fiona, most of the calls from district concerns were about the state of our roads, as is all seen pictures and everything. I've emailed and spoke to Steve McDonald, and he's aware of the work, and it has started and continued to be ongoing. Uh, a lot of repairs are needed, just not a Band-Aid approach. That's what uh, the residents of District 7 are, are worried about. Um, other than that, uh, I think I think a lot of people are still a little bit in shock <laughs> over the damages. And uh, so I'm, I'm sure there'll be more, more phone calls to come. But um, like I said, I've spoke to Mr. McDonald and uh, there's some work to be done, but there's a whole lot of work that needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you. and. Um... And it was made very clear to Deputy Warden and I and others that were down there that that's their message was made to us as well, that it's something more permanent in structure. And uh, of course, to you on behalf of Council, we want to uh, acknowledge the damage that your community took and that we uh, we were concerned in there and are continued to be concerned until that situation improves. Uh, I have some uh, motions to make. A sure. Councilor Oregon moves that 500 be $500 be taken from each councillor, um, Councillor Daphne's, Councillor McDonald's, and my budget for a total of $1,500 for Cabot Education Center for food support. We have a seconder for that motion, please. Second by the Deputy Warden. All in favor? Aye. Contrary minded. Motion is carried. I, Councillor Oregon, move that I take $1,000 from my district budget for St. John's Anglican Church to help with expenses. Second for that, please. Second by Councilor McDonald. All in favor? Aye. Contrary minded. Motion's carried. I, Council Oregon, move that I take $1,000 from my district budget, budget for St. Andrew's Anakin Church to help with expenses. Thousand. Do we have a seconder for that, please? Second by Council McDale. All in favor? Aye. Contrary minded. Motion is carried. I, Council Lord, move that I take $1,000 from my district budget for the North Bay Volunteer Fire Department. Seconder for the motion, Second please. Second it. Second by Council McDonald. All in favor? Uh, the last one is I, Council Lord, move that I take $1,000 out of my district budget for the Niels Harbor New Haven Volunteer Fire Department. I second it. Seconded. Seconded by Councillor Longa. All in favor? Contrary like minded. Santa Claus. <laughs> yeah, I see. That's that's it for me. Yeah, that you have no money left. <laughs> Councilor, and we uh, the fourth. I we didn't have a chance to say. Was there anybody opposed to the thousand dollars for the? I think it was the Anglican. Sure. Is everybody in favor? 
Okay, time to remind it. So those are all moved and seconded. So it for your district number seven. District number four. Okay, I had uh, constituents were concerned about, uh, as I said to Lyle, that they heard on CBC that the TMR system was uh, unpowered for some time, and and they were just asked why did it happen and uh, what what was needed for it not to happen in the future. I had lots of calls and conversations and damage in regard to the rock chip ceiling that was done on the North Shore. There was many windshields chipped and or broken, as well as paint chips to vehicles. And there were very long wait times, some were up to 45 minutes, um, which is pretty unacceptable. <laughs> um, the Long Hill Road is in desperate need of work. It needs gravel and grading. It's down to one lane and very dangerous as it's on a turn going up a hill and those are, that are forced to go into the other lane cannot see if traffic's coming. Um, I would uh, like to give $900 to the North River Community Hall and $900 to the English Town Community Hall uh, from my district budget. I've already requested 900 and received it for the North Shore and District Fire Department. I just wanted to put it in the minutes. Um, I'd like to make a motion to write a letter from the county to the North Shore and District Fire Department congratulating them on their 60th anniversary and also to the members who received their 25 year service pins. There are several of the members uh, in that department who actually have served for over 50 years. Um, the past district for Councillor Merrill McGinnis being one of them. Lyle's going to um, talk to uh, Randy about looking into uh, possibly getting 50 year service pins for those folks. Um, I'd like to thank Melody Daphne from the Clucking Hen who stepped up and supplied all the soup chowder and sandwiches to the Comfort Station and for all the volunteers from the, the fire department who manned it. And I'd like to congratulate and thank Mary Ann Wilson for all um, and those who helped her on the placemaking um, outdoor space in behind the fire hall at Indian Brook. It looks amazing. And uh, it was an enor enormous amount of work done there. And last but not least, the um, old bridge at uh, Tarbot Vale is still floating in the river. Um, there's still cement barriers up there and there's been no guardrails put up. And apparently the street light that was asked for there was not uh, put there either. And it's uh, coming on getting uh, darker earlier in the evening. And the gentleman who requested has like a lot of children going to school who have to walk on that road. So if, uh, I'd like to ask if uh, that could be followed up on again. And that's it for district four. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll second it. Thank you. Um, Councilor McLeod. Surprise me. <laughs> yeah, I have uh, two motions to do. Um, first, uh, the school buses don't have, uh, some of the school buses they have radios, um, but they come to my attention that some of them, uh, they travel in and uh, dead zones, they don't have reception. So I would like to um, send a letter. Um, Council my club moved to uh, write a letter to CBBC regarding radios in the school buses. Uh, to like to know how many buses and with the radios we have in all the schools, north and south of Smoky. And, uh, if, and then if they have um, to install the radios, especially in the school buses, they travel in dead zones, so there's no reception. It's for safety for students and for the driver. You make a motion. Second. And the second is just a letter for thank you to the Nova Scotia Power Crew and um, 
for the rapid response really was, uh, we're talking about five, seven days after all this damage. And if we couldn't send it to Emily McNeil, she's the, the Emily McNeil, uh, she's from the Nova Scotia Power and to the to the satellite here in Bedeck. Uh, so just a letter to the crew and staff for, thank you for, for what they do. So I consult my cloud, move a direct letter to Nova Scotia Power. Uh, thank you to the rapid response for the hurricane Fiona and the crew and staff. I second. And I have asked you as a council, um, they may, uh, as a member of the Cabreton Leap, uh, they invite me to the Atlantic Leap Summit in Halifax in October 27 and 28. So I'm asking for council to permission to be out of this, the county for that day. So we have a uh, motion. Do we have a motion to uh, approve uh, Council McCow traveling off island to attend that conference that she's been invited to? Thank you, Deputy Warden. Do we have a seconder, please? Second by Councilor McDonald. Thank you. Thank you. All in favor? Very good. Good to go. Thanks. Thank you. Councilor McDonald, anything from District 8? Yes, sir. Thank you, Warden. Just a few things this afternoon. I'd like to first uh, just want to say thank you for to Emily Keith Bain, who attended this morning. It was a very well-rounded meeting, I believe. And I think all the concerns from the councillors were heard by Mr. Bain. I just like to uh, want the minister to reflect about the importance of the ambulance service in South and North of Smoky in particular. And I think he's, uh, he's going to take that message back to the province that something has to be done immediately in regard to that. And um, the other thing I'd like to bring up too was just with, uh, with the Department of Transportation, I'd asked him this morning about the bridge in, in Aspie Bay there that's been has been neglected since July. DOT is aware of it. They keep saying it's under the radar, but in all honesty, they're not doing nothing about it, right? There's people getting tires punctured and there's nails actually protruding. So I just like to understand what their radar consists of. When is it going to be done? Like you know, now it's October, but the importance of that has to be looked at. And and all that has been emailed to uh, to the area manager as well, right? He is aware of it. So I just like the minister to reflect that. If I could, um, I'd be I'd like to make a motion also with regard to a private lane. This has gone through uh, Department of Transportation and District Planning Commission. And I'd like to make a motion as I, Councillor McDonald, move that a road name petition form be submitted for approval by council with the name change of Big David's Lane, which is located in South Harbor. That uh, application was submitted already by the residents of that lane to Eastern Planning and Department of Transportation. If I could please make that a motion for council's approval. We have a motion. Do we have a seconder, please? No, second that. Seconded by the deputy warden. All in favor? Aye. Contrary minded. The motion is carried. But sir, I just want to take uh, $1,500 from my District 8 budget, 500 of that being to the North Highlands Elementary Home and School. 500 to the Bay St. Lawrence Sun Gym and 500 to the Cabot Volunteer Fire Department. Thank you. I got so much written there, I apologize. <laughs> I can't even read my own scribbles. <laughs> I'd just like the minister to reflect that if I could. Sure, the, it's reflected the minutes. Yep, 500 to each of those organizations. Thank you. And um, that's it, sir. Thank you, Councillor. Appreciate that. Deputy Warden. Yes, thank you, Warden. Uh, there's a couple of things this evening. Uh, first, I want to publicly uh, commend uh, one of our Nova Scotia Power linesmen, uh, Jeff uh, Gillis in Inganish. I mean, he worked very closely with all three councillors north of Smoky, making sure everyone was reconnected. And I, I seen the stress he was under and how much he was dealing with trying to arrange everything, but he still took the time out to contact every one of us. Um, and I think he's a, a, a fine rep representative of Nova Scotia Power. But uh, once again, I just want to publicly say thank you to Jeff for that. Uh, second, I'd like to make a motion, um, well, I guess before I make the motion, is that uh, finally after three years, we are going to have the North of Smoky Parade of Lights again, which happens every day end of November 1st of December, which is a light-up parade that goes from the Parish Hall through the Inganish to the Celtic Lodge, where there's a reception to follow. Uh, for years, the municipality, we did the Santa Claus Parade, so we do have a sled, and we invite Santa Claus down, and he 
gracefully shows up every year. And, um, but uh, I was up, uh, we've moved all the stuff from the ski lodge to the fire hall and I was up the other night to look at it. And it's been moved around a number of times where it's at the fire hall and it's in quite bad shape and the sled needs repainting and a lot of the lights are broke. So I'm making a motion that $500 be provided uh, to replenish the lights and paintings of, of the float uh, from, the count, from the county. So I make that a motion. Yep. Uh, do we have a second for that, please? Second. Second by Councilor McLeod. All in favor? Kind of reminded. Motion is carried. And again, like uh, Councillor uh, McDonald mentioned, uh, it was great having MLA Bain here today, and he did take our concerns back. And the ambulance probably being the number one in our healthcare system, uh, but also roadways, uh, things such as so the Cabot Trail and Beach Crossing Road were brought up. And uh, I'm confident that uh, Mr. Bain will be uh, pursuing these uh, with great vigor. So thank you very much. Thank you, Deputy Warden. Councillor McNeil. Thank you, Warden. Uh, if a uh, I'd like recognition of Sean McSween too with Nova Scotia Power. Uh, I contacted him on a number of situations, although we, we, we got our power back within a day and a half of the storm. And uh, there was a number of individual houses that didn't have power for a couple of days after that. But I was able to contact uh, Mr. McSween about them and he got it rectified really quick. So I have to uh, commend him on that. Uh, Again, I apologize for being late for council uh, today. I was at a ceremony at um, the Wadman Cultural Center, uh, parcel of land uh, the Mary Harper from the Mary Harper Nature Preserve was transferred to the Wadman Cook Conservancy Organization. It was a nice uh, ceremony. Uh, it was really showed like uh, the attitude of truth and reconciliation, uh, giving that land to, to Wagner and Cook. So also I'd like a letter of congratulations to Rodney Chesson. He received the Queen's Jubilee Medal yesterday. So oh, nice. I think we could write a letter. Uh, I'll make that a motion. Make a motion, please. Uh, so uh, we have a seconder for that, please. Yeah. Okay. Second by the Deputy Warden, all in favor? All right. Aye. Contrary minded, motion's carried. And, Congratulations to Rodney. Yeah, and uh, I did, I have been receiving a few uh, phone calls on the roads. Uh, I brought it up with MLA Keith Bain today, and I have been in contact with uh, area manager Steve McDonald about the, the road situation in the district. So that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, I have uh, two or three motions I would like to make this evening. I sent some of them around earlier. Um, First one is it was uh, they're making reference to the fact that uh, the premier would like to potentially have a uh, medical school located at CBU. Just made reference to that. I would like to make a motion that Victoria County Council send a report, uh, send a letter to the premier saying we support that project, and uh, hopefully it'll come to fruition. So I'd like to make that a motion. Uh, motion on the floor. Do you have a seconder for that motion? Second. Second by Councillor McLeod. All in favor. Aye. Contrary mind it. Motion passed. Um, and the second motion I'd like to make, I've submitted a name change request to the Department of Transportation. We'd like to change the uh, Campbell Street, which runs down from the Victoria Highland Civic Center. We changed that uh, to a Jessica Wong Lane, just in light and recognition of Jessica playing in the Olympics last year. It's uh, the street that goes down by the rink, so I think it's uh, very appropriate. And uh, I have uh, contacted all the homeowners and submitted the applications, and the uh, signs have been ordered. So sometime in the next uh, month or so, we'll have an unveiling, hopefully, if council approves, then it yeah, provides the motion to approve the name change as well. You so, realize that'll change the address of the liquor store. <laughs> the liquor store has given their approval. <laughs> <laughs> So we, it is a motion. Uh, motion seconder second for that second. motion. <laughs> second, Councillor <laughs> Councillor Patterson. All in favor? Aye. Contrary minded. Aye. Motion passed. And in light of talking about the uh, Victoria Island Civic Center, we uh, allocated a million dollars for uh, uh, to support their grant to rebuild that facility. Um, it's my understanding that that uh, will not qualify for this year's funding. So I'd like to make a motion we defer the money that we allocated to that project to next year's budget and that's a motion please uh, so we have a seconder for that motion second, second by councillor mcleod all in favor right. contrary minded motion passed just 
just want to double check that I didn't miss anything. And um, that's it. And I just want to catch in the, uh, I'm sorry, the witch. Yeah, I, we saw a notice uh, that there was uh, COVID relief. There was a lot of funding provided to Inverness County and a number of uh, municipalities around the um, Eastern Nova Scotia, but it did not show Victoria County receiving any. I don't know if that's because somebody didn't apply for it or they didn't know about it, but either way, I'd like to make a motion to send a note to our MP to ask him if that uh, funding was uh, made known to uh, our local residents as well, and perhaps uh, an explanation why uh, none of it was uh, allocated in Victoria County. Thank you for that. I knew I had it summers. So I'd like to make that a motion. Send that letter, please. Motion on the floor. We have a seconder for that motion. Second by Councillor McLeod. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Contrary minded? Uh, MP Batiste. And it's for COVID relief funding and or lack of applications from Victoria County or lack of approved applications. I'm not sure which it is. I would map $500 from my district budget to the uh, Kilt Walk for the uh, Victoria County Hospital Foundation. So like, just in the minutes, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda correspondence and uh, we did receive a letter for I uh, did receive a letter addressed to me from Parker Bars Dunham in regards to a number of the projects that are going on in the Bedeck area and he had suggested in his letter that uh, people should get together and have a discussion uh, as he references here that the uh, county plans to replace an antique county office fire station uh, that uh, a newer fire station could be um, planned or the replacement of the rink, a replacement of the farmer's market, meeting hall to more, meeting hall to hold more than 80 people and a new library. So he has uh, suggest, suggested to us that maybe somebody could, uh, these groups get together and do one large project, but um, I'm not sure that's a municipal responsibility at that point, but maybe we'll forward it on to our development officer for review and consideration. Yeah, more than I think that's a good idea. Uh, you know, when you think about it, and I don't know if it, uh, Councillor Daphne and I may have, the fire department, I don't know if it's a real fit because it's it's kind of a, a separate, it would take a big footprint too, a fire, a fire hall. Uh, but if you look at it, we've already uh, discussed, I guess, or considered uh, three of them the rink, the county office, and the library. And I guess my question is, Ward, if you have any further information from the library board, we got that no. email with their requirements. What, did anybody ever talk to anybody? Uh, Terry is our representative, right, Terry? And, and Jackie, are you on the no, library board uh, in Sydney? No, Bert, I'm sorry, Bert. Uh, maybe we should try to initiate the discussion with the library to get a sense of what they really need and, and if it's possible. Um, it could be a win-win if the rink were to rent to us and to the library. Yeah, I, I can't tell you, income generator uh, it's, it's public knowledge and public record that the library has met with the folks from the rink. They've also met with uh, people from Bold, so. Like I kind of leave it and, with them. Yeah. I, I and, think and, it's, we, and passing it on to the ED is a good idea. Yeah. And we have another year. Yes, yeah. that's, that's the exactly that we exactly. Have, so. You won't yeah. see any releasing, at least for the rink. I don't know about the others. Bold has a project. Um, and I don't know what the status of that is, but they're doing. But, but I don't think myself, and I, I agree with Deputy Warden, uh, the, the fire department is it, it would be a massive building. Then you know you're into big. Uh, the fire department, I think, has to be separate anyway and we'll, yeah. we'll see what happens with and it. it's yeah we'll, we'll pass it on yeah. and, and maybe she can just take a look at it it's it's the fire department belongs to the fire department and they can do whatever the fire department wants i guess but at the end of the day anyway i uh indicated to uh mr Burs dunham that i would he asked that his letter be tabled at council and it is tabled at council and we've yeah. referenced the highlights pardon me yeah. Yes, yep. Is there any other correspondence that you have? Is 
there any other we we sorry sorry committee report oh committee reports uh, it's not there, but we can, yeah, if you have, anybody has a committee report, which I guess you do, so please proceed. <laughs> uh, we have, just to let you know, we have a Victoria County Transit today uh, to the councillors who were not there. Uh, the report went well. Uh, we could, uh, we see um, the writing there getting up, so that's a good news. And uh, I think we are pleased today for the meeting we have today. Any other committee reports? Uh, to uh, just before we do, I would be remiss too to thank Keith Bain for coming here this morning. For those of us that may be joining us and don't know, we had a meeting with Keith Bain at 10 o'clock. We had a transit meeting at 1130 and we had a council meeting at two o'clock. So we had a full day today. I want to thank council for that. I want to thank Alex for stepping in for Leanne today. And I want to thank both Dan and uh, Steph for, uh, for uh, being here the through the whole uh, proceedings today. Uh, there's nothing else to come to council tonight. Uh, this afternoon, our next council meeting is October 17th at 2 p.m. Yes, sir. Like I uh, said in my email last night, I think it's too early to start. <laughs> to start the, what, yeah, yeah. When it, when, it, when it counts at the end of the season, I'll, I'll talk to you. Okay. The playoffs. We'll have a motion to adjourn. Thank you. Councilor McLeod has adjourned the meeting. See you on the 17th. Don't forget to take a look at that survey.